thank you so much. And what a great panel you did just there, really keeping, uh, bringing us some great information when it comes to the lessons learned, particularly about the electricity systems that around the world indeed have been resilient in, in most places. Um, also looking at the distribution models and the roadmaps that have to be in place and some good examples there from Egypt without a doubt. So we need to be hearing more of these, of course, in emerging markets and developing countries. This is indeed what is on everybody's mind. So great content there. Once again, thank you so much. We're now going to you know, turn our attention to the circular economy. And of course, the circular carbon economy, and we've heard quite a bit of this you know, in, in, in a variety of ways in the last few days, but really implementing the G20 communique. And I'm absolutely delighted now to welcome here at Atlantic Council, the president of the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, of course, Adam Saminsky joins me. Adam, thanks so much. We're really looking forward to this session. Thank you, uh, Edna. Uh, we're gonna have a great session really on the uh, idea of how you implement the G20 communique on the circular carbon economy. Uh, with us today, we have Joe Anise uh, from GE Gas Power, uh, Bill Brown from Net Power, uh, Regina Mayer from KPMG, Patty Padmanathan from Aqua Power, and Rich Powell from ClearPath. Uh, I would want to start off with just a little bit of background on the, uh, the circular carbon economy, then we'll jump into uh, how companies are dealing uh, with this idea, implementing the idea. Uh, the G20 leaders, so all the way at the top, uh, at the under the Saudi presidency in November 2020, endorsed uh, the circular carbon economy framework uh, with its four R's uh, uh, platform, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. Uh, I shorten this to CCE. Uh, it's uh, voluntary and holistic. It's a pragmatic approach. Uh, towards a more comprehensive, resilient, sustainable, and climate-friendly set of energy systems. Uh, the CCE framework encourages countries to take advantage of all technologies, all forms of energy, and mitigation opportunities. And it uh, considers resource availability, the economics associated with it, and natural circumstances. But the focus is really on sustainable development. Uh, the idea of the CCE is an extension of the circular economy, uh, the circular economy was developed as an alternative to the linear economy, now, and the linear economy is not sustainable. Circular economy seeks to use fewer raw materials and create uh, as little waste as possible while producing the same or even more uh, goods and services. Circular economy uh, does this through reducing resource use, reusing products, and recycling materials from products that can't be reused. The CCE uh, idea adds a fourth R or reduce to that uh, concept, uh, reduce the amount of carbon that has to be managed in the first place by using energy resources that don't create carbon, such as non-biomass renewables, wind and solar, nuclear power, uh, alongside energy efficiency. Uh, so there's opportunities in recycle. We see that in nature with trees and reuse, uh, chemicals, concrete, building aggregates, other fuels. There are plenty of ways that carbon dioxide can be used. And then finally, we need this remove option. We need it at scale. We've got to uh, lower the amount of carbon dioxide that's getting in the atmosphere to begin with. And we need technology that can remove it directly from the air and make it available for storage. So the principles of, of four R's, really they serve as a guiding framework in which the technological approaches are clustered, but it helps you look at the flows in the system and it helps you see where the choke points are and then it helps you, you identify uh, what you uh, need to do by focusing directly on the problem of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it, it treats carbon dioxide as just another element in the system. Carbon's not the enemy. The enemy is fugitive carbon. And so we're going to go after the fugitive carbon uh, in this approach. It allows economic development and diversification to continue, and it welcomes all of the options uh, that, uh, that can help us achieve climate goals. So now what we're going to do is we're going to explore, I think, some of the ideas for what are those technologies that can accomplish this. So I'd like to give each of our uh, panelists an opportunity 
to briefly describe the efforts that are underway at their companies uh, and, and uh, to develop projects associated with the four R's framework to so reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove of the circular carbon economy. Let's start with Joe Anise from GE Gas Power. Joe. Great, thank you so much, Adam. And it's great to be here with everyone today. Um, I hope everybody's doing well and, and safe. Um, I guess, let me first start with, I'll take the, uh, the reduce in those four R's, uh, Adam, and, and some of the things that he's doing around that. I think first and foremost, it starts uh, really at home with our own operations. So one of the things that GE has done um, announcing a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030. So, you know, walking the talk with our own operations. And it's a journey that we've already been on for the last uh, decade. We've already reduced our emissions um, by around 20%. And really what we're, you know, the way we're achieving that is by reducing our own emissions within our own operations, as well as making investments in the right smart power sourcing as well as taking on lean initiatives to eliminate waste. So, so those are some of the things that we're doing internally. Now, in, in terms of technology and the approach that, that we're taking, I'll, I'll share a few examples. You know, the first one is uh, implementing our, our latest efficient gas turbine in the H technology. Um, currently in the UAE, we're installing a 1.8 gigawatt plant. That's three of our nine HA gas turbines. Um, that, that plant will, when completed, will reduce the carbon dioxide emissions by about 4 million tons per year. And that's the equivalent of taking about a million cars off the UAE roads um, based on traditional um, technology. So that, that's a first example and an approach. Second is more of a low hanging fruit, but important because there are still parts of the world where power plants are still right, running in, in simple cycles. So, converting those power plants into combined cycle, achieving 50% more electricity with the same amount of fuel, reducing some of the, the, the footprint there um, is also another way of, of tackling this. Third area is uh, in our advanced gas path, um, which is our upgrades to some of our older turbines where we can improve the output and efficiency as well as reduce the emissions in those power plants. Um, so that, those are sort of three areas. The, the fourth is really around um, low, low heating value fuels. And you know, I know there's a lot of talk about hydrogen. Um, GE actually has 75 turbines around the globe currently operating with 6 million hours of operating hours on low heating value fuels. Um, so you know, one of the things that we've recently announced is our H plant in the US. Um, and our plan there is to uh, actually have that run on 100% hydrogen in the next couple of years. Um, so those are all areas that I think will have uh, an impact on how technology can help reduce uh, in this economy, Adam. So back to you. That's fantastic, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill, let's go to you. Tell us what Net Power is doing. Sure. Well, in, in Net Power is basically, we, we produce electricity from natural gas, capture 100% of the CO2, and do it at a cost of electricity that is well below existing power plants. Uh, we can take our, we can take the heat that net power produces. In addition, not only do we produce electricity, but we produce a lot of heat. That heat can then, in turn, produce produce hydrogen. That hydrogen we can hit in the United States around 57 cents a kilo. Uh, if we were in the UAE and had access to the sour gas, we could actually use our carbon dioxide to clean their sour gas really, really cheaply. It scrubs it well. We can hit hydrogen around 35 cents a kilo. That means uh, that's roughly equivalent to $2.85 a million BTU. Then take it one step further, we can use the nitrogen that net power produces for free and drive ammonia well below $100 a ton. All of a sudden, you're taking a piece of equipment putting it together with existing uh, technologies and really, really driving a carbon economy, a carbon free economy in ways that no one ever thought possible. That's, uh, that's fantastic, uh, uh, Bill. The whole idea of being able to utilize uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the turbine cycles is, uh, is an interesting innovation and, I, and we're all hoping you're gonna be successful in that. Uh, let's move on to uh, Regina Mayor at KPMG. Regina, tell us uh, tell us how how your company, which is not really a manufacturer 
what, what kind of angle are you bringing to this? Well, good morning from Houston, Texas. And I'm going to talk more about what I see my energy clients doing and how they're embracing what the, the, the energy transition means. Because the, as a fossil fuel provider, those companies could not agree more with the importance of reducing carbon. But what we're finding is that the narrative that's, that's a drumbeat that's surrounding the industry is about picking winners and losers and demonizing one form of, of energy versus the other. And what we subscribe to is an all of the above strategy. If we focus on the, the total output and the outcome that we want, which is reducing carbon from the atmosphere um, and, and identifying multiple ways, technologically innovative ways to do that, that's the key. Um, at the same time, we see the investor community starting to make choices as well about, well, we're, we're gonna discontinue investments in uh, traditionally carbon uh, hydrocarbon and fossil fuel types of investments, which doesn't allow us to continue to power the planet and provide electricity uh, to those parts of the world that currently don't have access to reliable and affordable electricity. So I represent the energy industry that's trying to at least change that narrative and say, let's focus on carbon reduction. And there's lots of different really exciting technologies that they're exploring. Just hit a couple in addition to you know what Joe and Bill mentioned, energy efficiency and energy management. Uh, there are virtual power plant designs that are up and running about how to manage non-traditional sources that come into the grid and better optimize the overall distribution network uh, to totally reduce the carbon footprint. Hydrogen is a very big topic of discussion. We've already hit on it a couple times, but there are pilot plants in Australia. There's one that's just being built in California as well uh, on green hydrogen test units that will power a house uh, using completely green hydrogen. Battery efficiency and battery recycling, right? If we can get to the point where we can mine the components of the batteries that come from parts of the world that we don't want to be holding to, that is an area of technology that will continue to drive us forward positively. Their direct air capture and carbon sequestration um, modes and, and carbon reuse technologies that are in place today in the Permian and, and elsewhere. Uh, we have waste to energy solutions. And I know my colleague, Jennifer uh, Holmgren from Lanza Tech was on an earlier panel and she's got some terrific um, technology that takes waste offshoots and then turns that into plastic streams as well as jet fuel streams. Um, and then the last one that I, I'm a little partial to is geothermal and what can we do to you know harness the uh, the energy that sits below the earth's crust and there's there's um, experiments going on in my home state of Hawaii as well as as Adam our home our, our alma mater at Cornell where they want to be le a leader in the geothermal uh, space oh, so we need to you know, for that have all of the above you. right and, and not demonize one versus the other. Uh, thank you. You know, at some point, I'd love to hear, too, about uh, how we can get a good set of accounting rules to measure the performance associated with doing all of this. Uh, let's move to uh, Patty Padmanathan at Aquapower. Patty, tell us what uh, you've been up to recently. Well, thank you, Adam. Good day to you, you all of you. I'm delighted to contribute to this uh, discussion. So even though the circular approach to reduce, reuse, and recycle will intrinsically lower the overall energy use by decreasing resource utilization and increasing efficiency, energy will still get expended or be input to reuse, recycle, and for sure to remove. In embracing the circular carbon economy, we at Aquapa have focused our attention on lowering the cost of production of that energy that will be utilized in reusing, recycling, and removing while minimizing carbon emissions and keep diminishing that energy cost by embracing the most up-to-date, reliable, deployable, renewable energy technology, particularly. Our ability to now deliver solar and wind energy at way less than two cents per kilowatt hour in certain geographies, albeit when only when the sun or the wind is blowing, a cost at which electricity has never ever been produced with any alternative fuel or resource anywhere ever in human history for any duration is truly transformative as it can now make reuse, recycle and remove even more cost competitive than before. And on top of that, with renewable energy generate electricity at less than two cents kind of level, producing hydrogen using that electrical energy intensive process of electrolysis is beginning to look not so stunningly expensive. And what is interesting about hydrogen, of course, is the versatility as it cuts across all 
all of the four R's in the circular carbon economy. It can be used to produce a variety of synthetic fuels, many of which are compatible with existing energy infrastructure and can be used to decarbonize a range of hard to abate sectors due to its ability to be a reactive agent and to produce high temperature heat. So we at Aquapa will do our best, our very best to keep playing a very central part in enabling the and propagating the circular carbon economy by focusing at generating electricity with renewable energy at ever decreasing cost. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Patty. Uh, let's move on now to uh, Rich Powell at uh, ClearPath. Uh, ClearPath works on the policy side. So Rich, tell us a little bit about that. Well, thanks, Adam. Huge thanks to the Atlantic Council and the Energy Forum. Really happy to be here. Greetings to everybody tuning in. Uh, very, very pleased to be part of this uh, August panel, this August discussion. So at ClearPath, we're, we're a little bit the odd person out of this. We don't have a company or a service offering. We're advocates. So we, we work on behalf of the field uh, to try and scale up many of these technologies. We focus on the full suite of zero carbon flexible energy sources. So fossils and industrial processes with carbon capture, carbon dioxide removal, hydrogen, nuclear, flexible renewables like geothermal and, and hydropower and energy storage to make the variable renewables into flexible generating sources. We're very involved in the expansion and reform of the federal energy innovation apparatus here in DC. The, the United States has the largest clean energy innovation program on the planet, uh, but those resources in our view could be better used, better leveraged uh, and better directed. Um, one thing I'll just quickly note is amidst all of the transition and administration uh, here in the United States over the past month, uh, folks may not have gotten the note that we passed historic energy innovation legislation in December. So the, the largest reform and expansion of clean energy legislation in more than a decade sort of made it through as part of a massive, uh, a massive deal. And that has a lot to do with the circular carbon economy. So that legislation, amongst many other things, set up a real moonshot program for demonstrating next generation carbon capture technology here in the US over the next five years. And it's on all emitting sources, so natural gas fired power plants, coal fired power plants, industrial processes, and even carbon dioxide removal technologies. And we also significantly extended the 45Q tax incentive, which is the sort of world leading federal tax incentive for deployment of carbon capture technology. And that's extended now through the middle of this decade. So, uh, oh, the United States remains, uh, right. yes, the, the United States remains a good place for uh, carbon, carbon capture technology. Uh, Rich, we're going to move into the uh, question uh, session now, uh, but let me remind our uh, viewers that uh, you can use the app to submit a question. And, and Rich, maybe you might be well placed to answer this one. In that legislation or in general, is there a role for geothermal um, power? Uh, how do you see that one? And I see Re Regina's shaking her yet head yes, too, so we might want to got a comment from her at some point, but a quick comment on geothermal. Absolutely. So, so the great thing about this legislation is it covered all of the clean generating sources. So just like there's a moonshot for uh, demonstrating carbon capture technologies, there's also a moonshot for demonstrating enhanced geothermal technologies. And I think, you know, to this circular carbon economy conversation, there's actually interesting overlap now occurring between the oil and gas industry and the carbon management industry and the geothermal industry, because obviously a lot of the same technologies, drilling technologies, hydraulic fracturing technologies are now being taken up by the enhanced geothermal industry uh, as well. So a lot of exciting synergies there on the innovation side. Great. Let's quickly shift to uh, Joe and Nice again, back to uh, GE Gas Power. Joe, uh, uh, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, natural gas is, uh, is a, a hydrocarbon fuel, it's a fossil fuel, it's got, uh, uh, when you combust it, you're going to have carbon dioxide. Uh, how do you, uh, I think you talked a little bit about how that could be minimized, but could you just go over for us once again how, uh, how you think uh, uh, gas, uh, the role that gas can play? Perhaps. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. No, thanks, Adam. Um, look, I think, you know, if you if you take the current global emissions um, today, um, a good portion, about 40% of that is coming from power generation, right? And of that power generation, again, about 40% of that is coming from coal. Um, so I think in the in the in the immediate term, 
um, that is an area for us to tackle. Um, and as, as coal generation gets replaced with uh, renewables, um, again, that's going to take probably up to 2040 before maybe 50% of the global power generation would be renewable sources. So in that, in that shift, this is the role that gas has to play. I think gas is uh, relatively affordable and accessible, and uh, it is uh, quick to deploy. Uh, you know, your average uh, gas combined cycle power plant can, can be deployed within 24 to 36 months. Um, and, and then it provides the necessary stability, I would say, for the variability that occurs within the grids as, as countries are, and grids are shifting with renewable sources. Um, the third piece really is what I talked about earlier, which is um, the ability to also burn hydrogen and, and even a combination of, of carbon capture as well. I think all of those would, would play a role um, between now and 2040 in reducing the emissions globally. Yeah, I, it's interesting your mention of coal. I, I think uh, finding some way to uh, to be able to uh, help uh, India and China uh, move forward um, on uh, dealing with coal is going to be a very important aspect of things going forward. Uh, Bill, uh, you spoke earlier this month at a Atlantic Council event, uh, and you talked about the circular economy and and the circular carbon economy and and existing technology. I mean, do we need all new technology to make this happen? I mean, what what existing technology is going to be available to help us with the climate goals that we all agree to? Well, Adam, we've got to spend $50 trillion to get to net zero. That right. means we've got to spend three to $6 billion every day for 30 years. And so, and that's, that's going to be impossible unless we use existing equipment. That's really important to understand. And you heard me talk about what net power is doing for power, hydrogen, and, and ammonia earlier. Those, those numbers I mentioned clearly would enable a lot. If we saw those numbers, we'd be well on our way to net zero. So what's the problem? Uh, take something as simple as this pen. I could have a pen uh, for signing important papers. I could have a pen for taking notes. I could have a, another pen to write a letter. Yet we all know that while we might prefer different pens for different purposes, we really don't need different pens. If we had to buy a pen for everything new, it, it wouldn't be economic. Our point is we believe we only need one pen, and that's the key to the whole thing. Uh, we only need one equipment to produce power. Uh, um, to, well, actually, today we think we need one piece of equipment to, to produce power, one to produce nitrogen, one to produce hydrogen, and put all that together, you get ammonia. And that's why most people don't think that existing equipment can drive this circular economy. But what if instead we integrated all that equipment and used it efficiently? And net power enables that by you know, we take net power, we integrate it with existing hydrogen and ammonia processes to get those numbers. And by using that existing equipment and by rethinking, so I'd add, I'd add a fifth R is rethink. By rethinking, uh, we can get to net zero much faster. One of the, uh, you're making me smile a little bit, Bill. Uh, I got a sixth R, which is we do all of these things and then repeat. <laughs> and rinse. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Regina, let's uh, move on to uh, to a little bit, uh, something very timely, uh, given the uh, inauguration in the United States yesterday of, uh, of Joe Biden as the president. Uh, what kinds of energy policies do you think the Biden administration is going to follow? And uh, could they be committed to this idea of the circular carbon economy? What do you think? And I think there's two different elements of what the Biden administration will mean. There's a there's the global aspect. Um, you know, he signed the executive order to return the U.S. to the Paris Accord. Um, he's got John Kerry as a climate czar. Those moves are direct, directly intended to ease the angst of our allies and to demonstrate the commitment that the U.S. is back in the climate game uh, and that we will be a full participant. So I think that's that's going to be really positive. On the domestic front, there's a bit of concern. You know, uh, the Trump administration had been uh, aggressively rolling back a series of regulations, a hundred different regulations, seventy percent of which were were rolled back. What's that going to do on the policy front? We expect that 
Um, there will be re-regulation, particularly around emissions reductions, although I think the industry is not too worried about that because most of the, the positive operators had already been working on emissions reductions. So that will just level the playing field so that those that were perhaps considered to be bad actors um, will have the same cost profile so that we are focusing on methane uh, uh, capture and less flaring and um, all of the different components of, of emissions regulation. There is a concern because he has, he has said that he wants the grid to be net zero by 2035. That would be an incredibly aggressive goal to reach. The, the view is that that's gonna be a posture, but there will be horse trading. So the, the timeline will move out. There's some conservative Democrats that have very senior roles on the energy policy committees. So we will have a net zero goal, but it will be a, a more measured approach to it. And then the last one that's gotten a lot of play is no drilling on public lands. Well, we can see from the leasing op options that we just had on the ANWR, the, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the only serious bidder was the state of Alaska. So it's not as though oil companies are clamoring for the ability to get new leases. So they'll be able to continue to drill and produce on the leases that they have. Um, and then they won't be drilling on new leases, but that won't have a major impact. Um, midstream investments are a little bit more tricky, but all in all, I think it'll have a much more moderate effect and it'll bring the US back to being a major player at the global climate table, which I think is all gonna be very positive. Right, the uh, run up to uh, COP26 in uh, Glasgow at the uh, end of this year. Yes. Uh, there has a, a, we've had a question come in uh, about the role of uh, carbon recycling uh, in plastics. Uh, I don't know whether there's anybody here that wants to hold their hand up and, and uh, provide a quick uh, thought on, on uh, recycle reuse in the, in the uh, plastics area. You know, if I mean, look, Patty, go ahead. Yeah, the quick comment I can make is that uh, in Saudi Arabia, Sabic is already um, is already doing that. They have uh, it's 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 not just a pilot plant anymore. They're starting to actually run plants uh, doing exactly that. And there, I think it's early days, and there is a lot more opportunity to go. Uh, but just to quickly kind of follow on on that in terms of so in the GCC, just about every country in that part of the world has embraced the need to decarbonize as quickly as possible by starting to diversify the fuel mix. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has committed itself um, and is getting on with uh, moving towards sort of 50% of generation capacity by renewables by 2030. That means 60 gigawatts to be deployed within the next decade. And they are rushing forward with an ambition. And they're rushing forward also with the ambition to decommission um, nearly 40 gigawatts of oil-fired power plant by 2030, um, rapidly embracing hydrogen uh, uh, economy. Uh, we are very involved in developing uh, a, a very global scale, 650 tons a day hydrogen plant at Neom. Uh, right. Part of that hydrogen will be used inside uh, Saudi and also um, uh, putting a lot of effort into uh, carbon capture and reuse um, like uh, the Sabic plant uh, and Aramco is uh, charging ahead with um, uh, several applications. Adam, you're very uh, involved with some of that and you're very familiar with it. The uh, uh, NEOM project is interesting. Green uh, hydrogen and ammonia uh, using uh, wind and solar as the uh, motive uh, power. Um, Saudi Aramco has also been working on uh, blue hydrogen uh, and there it's uh, using gas, uh, gas stream, gas liquids to, uh, pr to produce, uh, again, hydrogen and ammonia, but sequestering the CO2 in the very ample geologic storage available in the kingdom. Uh, back to SABIC, they've been uh, using CO2 to produce methanol and uh, fertilizers, urea. Uh, it's, uh, it, I think there are opportunities, and I had mentioned earlier just literally one word, uh, the opportunity, the potential to do things in with concrete, for example, uh, um, CO2 curing of concrete is something that uh, could ultimately, given the amount of concrete used all over the world, this might be a really interesting one. Uh, so, Patty, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I think that we're probably going to hear more about recycling and reuse. It's one of the smaller parts now of 
of the four R's. But I think that uh, again, I'm back to we need we need all we need to uh, really invest in all of these technologies. Find ways to dem develop and demonstrate uh, them. You never quite know where the breakthroughs are going to come, and we have to have to do it all. Rich, this brings us back to you. Perhaps uh, what uh, could you give us an example of a kind of a pragmatic approach to uh, to carbon management uh, that differs from some of the uh, ideas like simply banning uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, help us out with an example of what you've been trying to foster from a policy standpoint in that area. Sure, Adam. Well, I really liked what you said earlier, which is that carbon's not the problem. Fugitive carbon is the problem. You know, we often say it's not fossil fuels that are the problem, it's the emissions from fossil fuels that are the problem. And if we can eliminate the emissions or significantly reduce the emissions, there's no reason that we couldn't keep using these resources well into the future, perhaps, perhaps forever, as long as we can get the emissions under control. And so we have focused really deeply on finding ways to you know, use the existing infrastructure. I couldn't agree more with Bill's point about the need to find ways to use existing technologies and existing infrastructure for uh, for this transition, you know, we, we have thousands and thousands of miles of pipeline in the United States. What if we could use that as part of the energy transition and convert those pipelines so that they're carrying either carrying carbon dioxide that's captured back away from power plants, or they're instead carrying lower carbon fuels through the same pipelines like hydrogen or syngas or uh, uh, and, and and all these other uh, all these other potential low carbon fuels. So 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 that's probably a big difference in our approach versus some of the more sort of leave it in the ground uh, approaches out there to, to decarbonizing the economy. You know, one of the, uh, you made me think about an, another thing too, as far as plastics are concerned, plastics actually are very valuable in our economy. They're serving a lot of extremely useful purposes. And you could probably say the same thing about the problem with plastics is fugitive plastics. And we all <laughs> have seen the pictures uh, of you know, uh, you know, plastics in the oceans, in the rivers, uh, and so on, and and finding effective ways to deal with that, and uh, and there are a number of approaches that that can be applied. Is is really, I think, what we need to do. Uh, we we do have. Well, Adam, uh, on, on on. Yeah, please. Sorry, no, Adam, on the plastics piece, uh, we are net power is changing its, its refitting its plant down in, in Laporte right now to burn syngas. And the reason that syngas is so important is that we can take municipal solid waste and biomass and other things to produce syngas. And one of the biggest challenges to taking plastics or MSW and burning it is the uncertain uh, fuel mix or, or heating value of municipal solid waste. And because we have this CO2 that we recycle, we can dynamically recycle the CO2 to match the heating value and allows us to do MSW in ways that no one else can do. And so therefore we can take that plastic and, and MSW and use it as a direct fuel and get rid of this plastic, uh, this plastic uh, disposal problem and use it for energy instead. One other example I was gonna offer about reusing existing infrastructure that to piggyback off of Bill's point is, we've been doing some work with the city of Houston. You know, Houston has the single largest gray hydrogen system in the world. Well, if we could take that gray hydrogen system and convert it to blue and ultimately green, and then we can pipe that hydrogen into markets like California, you know, what a, what a terrific way to use existing infrastructure, existing resources to drive some of that carbon reduction. I think that's the way the industry is starting to, to look at it. So it's not net new necessarily. It's how do we take advantage of the systems we have in place today to lower the carbon footprint and provide these new sources of energy. And Regina, you're, yeah, we, uh, we have retrofit solutions for those. So, yeah. The... Uh, uh, you're reminding me, Regina, that the uh, that we're all using these colors, green, blue, gray, brown, hydrogen, and yeah. EPSARC is going to look into the possibility of, can we turn this into some kind of a numeric scale that actually measures the carbon footprint on a full cycle basis? And, <laughs> and uh, I've always been a numbers guy, and I, I, I think that we're all getting confused by the different colors of um, I joke uh, that it's the Roy G. Biv of hydrogen, <laughs> if that, that translates. <laughs> We can burn the hydrogen in, in a gas turbine. So if we get it to the plant, um, we can burn it. Um, for Joe or Regina, in the one minute we have left, uh, what uh, 
uh, how about direct air capture? It, it, do, is there something that we might do soon in the idea in the area of direct air capture? Not uh, projects underway. If you answer. want to try that, quick answer. So direct air capture, like many of these processes, require um, energy, and <clears throat> simply because it's we expensive. are reducing the cost yeah. of energy to such a level now. And um, again, we need to rerun the economics, huh? Because I think direct air capture is going to become cost competitive and, right. and value. And and the other the other component of that is, you know, in the US, tax incentives were absolutely critical to help scale wind and solar. And there is now a hefty tax incentive around carbon capture and carbon reuse. So I think that'll start to make the direct air capture components more economical, and it will start to create consortiums where people start harvesting okay. the carbon and then creating these tax offsets that can help others, you know, reduce their own carbon footprint uh, with the offsets and it, new markets are being created. I think that's very exciting as well. Well, we can actually do direct air capture using existing equipment. We can actually do direct air capture using chloralkali plants that are currently producing sodium hydroxide. We could do direct air capture in a year right well, now, rather okay. than a bunch of these new technologies, go. we can do it now. I love the idea. So we're gonna to have to go back to Aetna Trainer now for our next segment. Thank you, everybody. It was a fantastic panel thank and thank you to the Atlanta Council. Yeah. Thank you. It's great Over to be to here. Atna. A huge thanks to you too. And just before I let you go now, I know um, you know, the circular carbon economy is something very near and dear to your heart as well. Are you optimistic in terms of what you're hearing in this uh, dialogue and indeed many others? Was that a question for me, Atna? Yes. I, I'm, I think that there's lots of opportunities here and all kinds of technology. Super. Okay. Well, I know you're going to, to keep uh, working on that one and we're always delighted to hear from you. Thank you so much. I am now going to hand over to the director of the Council. Randy Bell joins us now. Randy, over to you. 